everybody, it's Randy from Reefs.com. I have the great pleasure to be here with Jamie Craggs, our 2018 MACNA Actress of the Year Award winner. Yeah. Congratulations on your award. Thank You've you, man. You've been in an elite group and I certainly have. Hobby. certainly have. Standing on the shoulders of giants. Absolutely. <laughs> right. So many of my mentors right. have, uh, you know, won it before, so it feels incredible. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really stoked. That's great. And we're, uh, we're really happy to have you here. For those of you who don't know, Jamie is the aquarium curator. aquarium curator at the Horniman Museum and Gardens in London, yep, in England. So he's come quite a ways to be with us yeah. and receive this award. So, folks who don't know, you're pretty much known in the hobby for uh, being a pioneer in the captive spawning of corals. Yeah. And so, if you could tell us a little bit about the work that you do. And, uh, yeah. So I've been um, working on uh, broadcast corals. Uh, so there's two reproductive modes that corals have: sexually reproductive modes. About 15% of them are brooders. So things like Pacillopora damicornis, that's a brooder. Right. And that has been spawning in people's tanks for years. Right. Then the biggest it's a point where it's a pest. Absolutely. <laughs> right. And then the biggest group are the broadcast spawners, and they're characterized by these sort of mass spawning events that happen over just one or two nights of the year. And so really I set myself the goal five, six years ago, um, while spawning events have happened in people's yeah. Uh, public aquariums, home tanks, yeah. it's always been accidental. I so see. I wanted to kind of crack the code of what is triggering those spawning events and whether I can make it predictable um, in a very planned and predictable way in aquariums. I see. So you, I assume you're using data from the field and yep. trying to translate that into a captive situation. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. spawning a coral um, can be no different to breeding a freshwater tetra from uh, the Amazon or a shark uh, you know, from the Pacific. It's about looking at what triggers that reproductive season um, and replicating that in our glass boxes, right? Right. And so corals can be no different to that. There's a, there's a whole bunch of cues that trigger them and then they go on you know, a few nights of the year. So I tried to sort of think along that kind of mentality right. of investigating as much as I could of what goes on in the wild. Um, and you know, there's so much technology that we have now uh, to run our aquariums that um, it al allows you know very sophisticated control of the of the environmental right. parameters. Right. So, what, what are your big successes? So, well, it started with a simple goal: could I get them to spawn? Um, so, I used brood stock or, or genotypes I had in aquariums for years, um, and within eight months, I got them to spawn, which is amazing. Um, but I didn't know the provenance of those those genotypes. So, to make this sort of not just a husbandry based project but a scientifically relevant project uh, I decided to focus on specific areas of the world so uh, I'm uh, replicating uh, Singapore in one of my systems and then I have three systems based on the Great Barrier Reef and so so that would be in terms of seasonal changes yep. temperature changes water chemistry potentially changes. yeah not, I've, we haven't delved into the water chemistry it, it might be playing a role but um we based it on, originally it was based on five parameters. So the first would be colony size. Right. So the, the old consensus is the colony would have to hit a set size before it becomes sexually reproductive. Right. Then you need to feed them. So, you know, obviously they're getting the, the byproducts and the zooxanthellae, but they're also voracious predators. Right. So gametes uh, are very uh, lipid uh, heavy. Mm. They, they, you know, they take a lot of energy and right? yeah. So the second would be heterotrophic feeding. And then the, the, the consensus is the trigger to initially stimulate them to start producing the gametes is temperature. So as we're going from winter into spring and the water is warming, it triggers the corals to start producing the eggs and sperm. And then as we get closer to the night of spawning, the interplay between the photo periods, the length of day, and the lunar cycle is the thing that triggers them to not just go on the, the right day of the year, but also the right time and some of these corals you know you can literally set your watch to them it's incredible so I've been following your work uh, quite a bit so you really do have it down now to where you know within a few yep. nights when when things are gonna go absolutely right. so know. we uh, we've spawned 18 species of a cropper now that's amazing. Um, and we we have a very good idea of when they're gonna go so we will have a you know a annual calendar and we'll be marking up, here's our artificial full moon. Yeah. Um, what we find is 
every single spawn we've had. So we have a lot of contact with researchers in Australia and, and, and past research in Singapore. So the Australian Institute for Marine Science is doing some amazing work on reproduction and the sea simulator manager, uh, when it builds up to spawning, he'll be giving me feedback oh, on what's spawning. And we find that every year we have a three day delay. So we have, a, we have a predicted date. So in the Great Barrier Reef is probably the most studied uh, reproductive um, uh, scenario. And so we know that Acropora tenuis, for instance, is the first one to spawn in that, that uh, build-up. Right. So they generally go so three, to four, uh, three to five nights after the full moon, either in November or December. And they also spawn very close after the sun set. So they're the first one to spawn in that, that oh, window of time. Oh, interesting. Um, what we find with ours is we have that three, three to four day delay. And so the tenures start going first, and then Armelia so porous. Same size. scenarios, just the same size. It's it's like shift. jet lag, basically. Well, <laughs> what? I mean, we've closed gametogenic cycles multiple yeah. times now. Yeah. So hopefully the jet lag's <laughs> gone and out of the way. But you know, we're hypothesizing maybe there's a hormonal cue and part of our filtration strips that out and so they don't get to that threshold oh, until a little bit later. I don't know, I'm speculating with that, but um, it would seem to make sense. The skimmers and carbon are taking some of those hormones out. And so now you've had the plan of life yep. set off. Yep. You're actually growing out coral. Yeah, yeah. So, the sort of, uh, you know, the first two, three years was developing the technique um, with the ultimate goal of being able to work with in vitro fertilization in, in captivity. Um, and that, that's now created the platform that opens up a whole world of opportunities. Now we can start, um, you know, once you've created the, the larvae, the, the, yeah, there's just so many experiments that can be run. And I'll talk a bit about that tomorrow. Okay, great. Um, some work that we've been doing with uh, um, just using scanning electron microscopy techniques and confocal laser scanning micro microscopy techniques to understand embryogenesis and the process of fertilization, um, thermal stress experiments, um, something called allogeneic responses. I'm going to blast can, everyone I, with it I tomorrow. I can see how excited this yeah, makes you, which is great. It's cool. Yeah. So let me just ask you, that's all fascinating, but what, is Matt, what does this award mean to you? What does coming here and getting this award feel like? I think uh, they are the legends that have uh, you know, won this in the past, so it feels incredible to be, be part of that exclusive group. You know, I mean, Charles, Julian were my inspiration when I was young. I've been in this industry 20 years and you know, follow them all the way through. And Charles really is one of my mentors, and it, uh, it's just, it's fantastic. It really is. That's great. I'm over the moon. So, you've done all this fantastic work. Do you see any practical applications for conservation, reef restoration? Or is it really just data collection at this point? No, or do you I mean, have a vision. I definitely have a vision. The. Uh, what drives me is uh, I'm definitely not a businessman. I, uh, you know, there, there's a, a huge economic potential, but this for for the industry and you know, seeing how the political environment is changing and uh, closing down the industry and in collection, I think this one from the industry point of view will become increasingly really important to be working with us. The thing that drives me is we know that climate change is affecting reefs badly in lots of areas of the world, and there's this increasing rise of people. Um, focusing on reef restoration efforts and so that's where I'm very much want this this work to be directed we, we've got a great partnership with Florida Aquarium um, they are big, building the biggest land-based coral nursery in the US I see. focusing uh, on uh, critically endangered species Acropora palmata and Cervicornis sure. and so through that partnership um, they're building replica um, systems, project coral systems out there, and we're looking at creating multiple spawnings uh, each year to get increased access to material uh, so we can plant more corals out and start rebuilding at a faster rate. That, that's, yeah. that's making that's me really, really exciting. You know, I'm, they're, they're picking this up, they've got the facilities, the resources to, to run with this and, and make it amazing. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. A very well deserved award. Thank you. Your research is fascinating, and folks out there, it's really groundbreaking. Cool. Really, nobody else is really doing this at this level. So, thank you. Fantastic stuff. And thanks for spending some time with us. And it's a very busy weekend for you. Oh, no, no, it's great. Thank you.
Bloody hell, that's getting over here. Oh, oh you smell it there too? Yeah. Oh, God.